cover-up in Oklahoma may be copied if copied in its entirety and without modification. Citizen Information Network has prepared this video in response to the growing awareness that the federal government and our established media have collaborated to deceive us about critical aspects of the Murrah Building bombing. This low-budget, voluntary effort contains several segments with some overlap and some blurred video footage. Nevertheless, the presentation will help viewers decide what really occurred at the Murrah Building, what was the broader meaning of that event and its aftermath, and what level of confidence we the people should have toward our public servants and our dominant news media. The first segment of this tape presents several clips of television news coverage that was broadcast immediately following the bombing. Most Americans are still unaware of the facts revealed by these early reports. We uh, just saw, if you were watching there, there was a white pickup truck backing a trailer into the scene here. They're trying to move people out of the way so they can get it in appears to be the Oklahoma County Bomb Squad. Uh, it's their bomb disposal unit, essentially, is what it is, and it is what they would use to, if, if the report that we gave you just a few moments ago turns out to be correct, that they have found a second explosive device of some kind inside this building. They'll back that trailer down there, and the uh, bomb squad folks will go in, and they will use that, uh, that trailer. You see the, the bucket on the back there, sort of, this is how they would transport the explosive device away from this populated area to try to do something with it. If you are uh, outside the metro area, you'd have to be well outside the metro area if you did not feel the blast that uh, occurred. This is just a, this few, moments is just a few moments ago. Be people running uh, north away from the federal building, you see them. Now confirmed uh, through federal authorities that a second bomb has been found inside that federal building in Oklahoma City. It was an explosion at 9 o'clock this morning that did that damage you're looking at right there, blowing off the entire north face of that building. Again, you're looking at the north face there. A second bomb was found on the east side of that building. A bomb squad is on the scene. That second bomb has not exploded. We don't know quite the status yet if they've managed to defuse it, but it has been confirmed that a second bomb was found on the east side of that building. And it here, Dave Balut here joining me. Dave, what do you have to add? Well, I just took a look down the street uh, at the Morrow building again. I see another bomb truck going, so apparently they're going to try to get out that third bomb that's been talked about. Still a lot of activity around the Morrow building. Uh, security concerns that another one still might go off. That's what everybody's worried about. That's the reason they have moved the media. Everyone's back. Let's take a look now, if we could. I understand we've just received videotape in. A news conference held just a few moments ago at St. Anthony's Hospital. Okay. This is Tom Coniglione. He's medical director of, the, of St. Anthony Hospital. This is Jim Maravich. He is uh, chief operating officer and executive vice president of the hospital. I'll give you their cards after the uh, conference is over so you'll know the spelling. Doctor, can you tell us the situation? Uh, the situation at the present time is that we have treated uh, more than 56 injuries. Uh, there have been several more since last count. Um, at the present time, the medical teams downtown are unable to get into the wreckage to retrieve more of the injured because of the presence of other uh, bombs in the area. I've been told by the police department that just as soon as those bombs are defused, they will permit the medical teams to enter. And then once the medical teams enter, we expect quite a large number of rather badly injured individuals being brought here. Can you tell us exactly where you were when the explosion hit? I was in the uh, city courts building, which is uh, just about two blocks south and one block west of the uh, federal building. And, and it was amazing that people walked down in the street and we looked in that direction and several people said, well, it looks like that's the federal building. Uh, somebody's bombed the federal building, somebody's bombed the federal courthouse, which was right across the street. 
um, because really there was nothing else that would explain this kind of force. That's what came to everyone's mind mm -hmm. was that it must be some type of explosive. Yeah, Mike, hang, hang with us just for a second. We want to update our audience that uh, the Justice Department is reporting that a second explosive device has been found in the AP Murrah uh, building in downtown Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, you're still with us, aren't you? Yes, I am. And I, and I might tell you in addition to that that in fact what we were told at the scene a few minutes ago was that in fact two different explosive devices were found in addition to the one that went off. So a total of three. A total saying. of three and of course then there was mass confusion whenever uh, uh, there were hundreds of spectators in the area and when they heard that there were other bombs in the building people were running from the area in the opposite direction as fast as they could trying to evacuate again. And you see the utter devastation that that one explosion caused because here's now what we are starting to learn about uh, the succession or what someone obviously hoped would be a succession of explosions. The first bomb that was in the federal building did go off. It did the damage that you see right there. The second explosive was found and diffused. The third explosive that was found and they are working on right now as we speak, I understand, both the second and third explosives, if you can imagine this, were larger than the first. So try to imagine two Boy. or threefold happening mm. uh, what we've already seen there. It is just uh, incredible to think that there was that much heavy artillery that was somehow moved into the downtown Oklahoma City Federal Building. This report of a second and third explosive device having been brought into the Murrah Building was broadcast before federal government officials and a compliant national media at the network level had the opportunity to massage the data, reducing the number of explosives and explosions to one, and positioning that bomb out in the street, not in the building. Moreover, these anchors reported that it was the first explosive device inside the building that caused the devastation. The second and third bombs were undetonated. Those bombs, in the possession of the authorities, would provide information about the perpetrators of this monstrous crime. Again, you're looking at obviously aerial pictures from Chopper 4. They kept us out for a while because of obvious reasons and we respect their demands on that. The reasons may have been obvious to these reporters, but they're not obvious to the rest of us. In the light of later reports of Oklahoma City police bomb squads who brought in a military EOD special bomb squad because an undetonated military bomb was found in the building, we would like to know why this information has been suppressed. Were the media people who claim to be the eyes and ears of the people shut out while federal agents removed security cameras which had recorded all activity in front of the federal building? If we are to trust our government, if we are to trust our media that claims to be independent, we need journalists who are not so deferential to the demands of our public servants. On that we are now there with our camera and our chopper and it gives you a bird's eye view of the devastation again one more time on this because we've been hoping this wouldn't be the case but it is the case six of the dead are children two are adults from this explosion today there was a daycare inside the building and uh, imagine the callousness of setting off a bomb where children are inside it's mind-boggling the daycare was on the second floor so we would assume that as they were starting to get uh, through their uh, early evacuation and rescue efforts before being called back because of the, uh, the concern over the other explosive devices, uh, that perhaps uh, the daycare area was one that they were able to get to first. I was on in the stairwell. I don't know. I know that some people were still in the building. They haven't gotten to yet. I saw a lot of people very badly hurt. Yeah, there were people were just getting out covered with blood and just stunned. I mean, it was just shock. Get out! Get them ready. And this is the point now where the evacuations began again, and you can see everybody starting to leave downtown for fear that the exact same thing was about to happen again. Fortunately, it didn't, because the second device that they found, we understand, was even more powerful than the first. 
They then found a third device, and you can see the look on this woman's face at the fear that she might have to go through the same thing again. They then found a third device, which was also larger than the first. Uh, hard to feel lucky at this point, but certainly through uh, some good work by some munitions experts and the uh, explosive sniffing dogs, further tragedy has almost certainly been averted here uh, today. The reports I have is that one device was, uh, was uh, deactivated. Apparently there's another device, and obviously whatever did the damage to the Murrah building was a tremendous, uh, very sophisticated explosive device. So, President Clinton just called Frank uh, Keating, Governor Frank Keating, and he says that three FBI anti-terrorist teams are en route to Oklahoma City. Right now, they are saying that this is the work of a sophisticated group. This is a very uh, sophisticated uh, device, and um, it has to have been done by an explosives expert, um, obviously, with this type of explosion. The reporter said government officials stated the bombing was the work of a sophisticated group. The explosive that went off in the building was a very sophisticated device. It would take an explosive expert to have done that amount of damage. Now, these news reports were all made during the first few hours since the tragedy struck. Given a little time, government spokespeople changed all this. It wasn't a sophisticated group, but rather two or three men of nondescript skills. Nor was it a very sophisticated device. Why, it was just a mix of fertilizer and ammonia that any old farm boy could put together. And the damage, massive as it was, was in complete concert with the explosives in a car, later a truck, parked out in the street. Say, isn't it funny how a little time changes things? Also, we're getting word now that President Clinton is sending anti-terrorism units down here to, teams, to, to look over the situation to find out exactly what went on and what other danger may be out there in Oklahoma City. That's something we need to think about, unfortunately, at this time, because, as we've told you, two other explosive devices were found that were not detonated, and they were larger than the first. This weather is going to make things uh, far more difficult, unfortunately, on the firefighters down there because it's... We've told you on a couple of occasions now, they are really only just now beginning, thanks to the big, uh, I guess it was about an hour and a half delay or so, uh, while they were second, worried about the second yeah. and third devices that they had found, uh, they are really only now starting to uh, really get full force into the rescue and search operation going all through all nine floors of the building uh, that are above ground, four floors of parking garages that are below. You talk about uh, the second bomb that was found. Uh, Devin told us earlier we got information that the second and third bomb were bigger than the one that was detonated, 1,200 pounds of explosives in that first one that went off. The second and third devices that were found were actually larger than that, so you can imagine what that would have been like. Imagine anybody uh, not knowing exactly what's going on at this point, but if for some reason you were just now getting caught up to speed at about 9 o'clock this morning, an explosion rocked a good part of central Oklahoma uh, and most of downtown Oklahoma City at the Alfred Muir Federal Building. About 9 a.m. this morning, that was uh, the first uh, explosive device. There were a total of three, we understand, found. Only one detonated, and fortunately it was the smallest of the three. Uh, but it was enough to tear away just a huge chunk, the entire front of the federal building. As they started the rescue efforts, they were about 30 minutes into the rescue efforts, 30 to 45 minutes in, uh, that was when they were alerted to the presence of the other two devices, and that put uh, the brakes on the rescue and and now, Devin, we're, getting, we're getting word of another bomb threat now, Devin, to talk about the two after the initial blast. Our crews are being moved back in downtown Oklahoma City because of another bomb threat down there. Sorry, evacuating. John, can you tell me? They, they have the found... Squad there. It's supposed to be the west corner of the bomb building. squad is there, west corner of the Murrah building. Is that correct? Another bomb inside the Murrah building. Supposedly, there may be another device there. There may be another device there, and they are evacuating the area. And we'll okay. reiterate again what these uh, later devices are doing to the rescue effort. Time is so valuable right now as they try to get to these people who uh, perhaps uh, somehow are still hanging on uh, to life inside that building. And each delay, every time the firefighters and the rescuers are caught to, are, are called back and brought back down off of their ladders and scaffoldings, uh, just could be exacting a terrible, terrible toll on the people who are already inside. Yes, it is. And we talked earlier about the two 
undetonated bombs that were found that were bigger than the device that exploded. And if this other one that they're looking at now turns out to be something, it appears that it was meant for this building to come down, to be leveled, yeah. because of the uh, amount of power that could have gone off. Only one explosion, it was obviously tragic enough, but there were more bombs set to go off, according to ATF officials. It's been about five hours now since that first explosion occurred, almost five hours exactly. Uh, you probably, if you were in bed at the time that it uh, rattled you around, you looked at the alarm clock, you'll remember the time, and you will certainly now remember April 19th, 1995. But five hours since, and uh, because of these renewed concerns about new devices, five hours in, they are still really not able to get the uh, rescue effort into full swing. Been listening to Mike McCurry, uh, President Clinton's spokesperson at the White House. Apparently, at this point, we know a little bit more than yeah. the White House does because we have been able to confirm that it was a car explosion. Now, that word coming to us from Mayor Ron Norick earlier, 1,200 pounds of explosives parked out in front of the federal building. And ATF has confirmed that as well. Devin, we're getting more word on that car bomb now. Let us read this straight from the wire. You talked about it a minute ago. The head of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms now says it appears it was a car bomb with as much as 1,200 pounds of explosives packed inside. 1,200 pounds of explosives packed inside that car bomb in front of the federal building. We heard earlier off the wire that from the governor that some of the fatalities were outside and across the street from the building. Now it all makes sense because the bomb was parked outside in a car. We've now moved from three bombs inside the building to one bomb with as much as 1,200 pounds of explosive par parked outside the building. The government official at the ATF will later change this to a rider truck in order to accommodate a larger supply of explosives than 1,200 pounds because that small amount of charge could not do the vast damage done to the Murrah building. But the steady escalation of the amount of explosives on the street and the invention of a bright yellow truck doesn't solve the problems the ATF officials and the obliging media representatives are dealing with. Such a car or truck bomb simply couldn't have taken out those support columns of the federal building. At the World Trade Center bombing in New York, the truck bomb was even larger than the final invention of the ATF at Oklahoma City, and the Trade Center bomb was parked in the garage right next to a support column. Yet all the Trade Center support columns remained intact. Moreover, the explosive force of any bomb falls off at the inverse cube of the distance from the bomb. The so-called rider truck bomb was parked outside the federal building. Now, this may all make sense to that reporter, but it makes no sense at all to anyone with a little time to make comparisons and to do some honest reflection. Now, Dr. Randall Heather is with us. He's a terrorism expert. Doctor, we are just shocked that this would happen here in the heartland of America. Should we be shocked about a car bomb in Oklahoma City? Well, any place you have a federal building, uh, you have a target. But that's the question everybody has right now. Why here? Why Oklahoma City? And and uh, you find out by finding why that building. I don't think it's I don't think it's material that it was in Oklahoma City. It's really the building. The building could have been in any city in the United States. The question is why that building. And was it Waco? Uh, is it the uh, Nation of Islam? We should find out an awful lot uh, when the bombs are taken apart. I think it was a, a great stroke of luck. Uh, you're mentioning it's hard to talk about luck on a day like today in Oklahoma City. But it was a great stroke of luck that we actually have got diffused bombs. It's through the bomb material that we will be able to track down uh, who committed this atrocity. All right, Dr. Randall Heather, a terrorism expert, we appreciate your time and your thoughts today, and I assume that we will be speaking with you again here in the hours and days to come. Dr. Heather spoke of a great stroke of luck. There was even a trace of a smile as he said this. In the authorities' possession of an entire defused explosive device that would lead them to the terrorists responsible for this tragedy. Heather said this was of great importance, a tremendous asset. Why haven't we heard more of this invaluable resource? Why is it that later media output speaks only of a single fertilizer bomb 
with no further revelations about the other bombs. The anchor said he was sure the public would be hearing more from this expert on terrorism, Dr. Randall Heather. Well, we haven't heard anything from him since. Is it because what he said cannot be made to fit the scenario created for us by the FBI, the ATF, Janet Reno, Bill Clinton, and the horde of media jackals who act as conduits for their misinformation? Well, we okay, heard earlier from uh, Dr. Heather who told us that the fact that they were able to find some yeah. of these devices undetonated is certainly going to help in their investigation. So let's go down now to Suzanne Steely. Suzanne? Devin, I got out of Chopper 4 just a few minutes ago and got really the first aerial look at this building. Of course, from this side, you can see the scope of the devastation, but you can't really see how much of the building is affected. Well, from the air, I could see that there practically a third of it is blown away and that the worst of the damage is on the east side where there's a little pocket where it seems like the force of the explosion hit and half the building there is gone. When you look at the building, as, as we've heard from so many people who've been in there, it, basically some of the floors have just crashed together. I mean, there are some points where you just literally can't get in at all. And then from Chopper 4, at some particular points, we could see all the way through the building. That's the force of the explosion. It just blew out all the walls and everything inside. Notice but this reporter's language. The explosion blew out all the walls and everything inside. She didn't say the walls were blown in or that everything inside was blown further in, they were all blown out. This report, which came early in the ordeal, is consistent with other journalists' news stories. The May 1st edition of Newsweek on pages 45, 44, and 57 carried illustrations of that devastation with reports that parts of the Murrah building were blown out, not in showing parts of the Murrah building that were blown directly across the street into the facade of the Journal Record building. It's clearly a physical impossibility for a bomb in a car or truck to blow parts of the Federal building out, making a path directly across the parking site of that car or truck and hitting the Journal Record building. However, explosives inside the Murrah building would have created just such a pattern of destruction. Further corroboration of the inside nature of this terrorist work may be seen in the May 1st edition of Time magazine, which details the experience of Candy Avey, who had just parked her car outside the building and was headed for the Social Security office when she was blown back, wrapped around the parking meter. Her face hit the car. Now, she was blown back away from the building rather than toward it as would have been the case had the explosion come from the street in front of the building. Note these large pieces of debris that were thrown all the way across the street from the Murrah building. Uh, that we have here, you can see the sheriff's uh, bomb squad. These people have been obviously very, very busy today. They've just pulled up. They're continuing to stay in the area. And uh, as we have more information, we'll bring it to you. Back to you guys. Where has all this information gone? How did these many reports and all this evidence of an explosion and explosives within the building become condensed into a single fertilizer bomb located in a vehicle on the street outside? The next segment of this tape was extracted from an Austin, Texas public access cable TV interview with the premier explosive expert, General Benton K. Parton. Remarkably, the pronouncements of General Parton and similar statements of other top experts in the field have either been underplayed or altogether neglected by the media. Although this segment has marginal technical quality, it accurately presents the analysis by explosives expert General Parton. Uh, General Parton, would you explain to us a little bit about your career in the United States Air Force? I was in the Air Force 31 years, active duty, <clears throat> and I spent 25 years in research and development. Uh, most of that was in the weapons area. I had graduate training in armament engineering. <clears throat> I went to the various laboratories at the uh, Ballistic Research Laboratory. 
where I designed warheads. In fact, I did the design and development work for the first Beaumont warhead there. Mm -hmm. uh, I had experience blowing up targets and all kinds of terminal ballistics and knowing what the explosives will do and what they won't do. I moved on into the Air Force Systems Command. I was a commander of the Air Force Armament Technology Laboratory, which uh, mm. covered all that area for the Air Force. I was the first chairman of the, uh, in the Office of the Secretary of Defense of the Air Munitions Requirements and Development Committee, which was harmonizing the requirements for all air-delivered weapons for the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps. So I spent 25 years uh, in all areas of uh, Air Force armament work, and I have had a lot of experience in uh, combat damage evaluation also. So I know what you can do with explosives, what you can't do. When I first looked at the, the reports coming out of Oklahoma, I knew that the truth was not coming out. The media was uh, was very much confused or passing out disinformation, and I think some of the officials down there were putting out disinformation. And what was going on down there was totally uh, at odds with what I had uh, 25 years' experience of knowing. Okay. So I got all the information I could together and uh, took a look at it and ran some analyses, put the damage profiles on the building, and. And I concluded that there was a very high probability and a high level of confidence that there were demolition charges in the building. Uh, and I uh, wrote, I thought it was very important that the Senate and the House move to have an independent investigation in Oklahoma City because it needed to be established without question uh, whether and how many uh, demolition charges were in that building because it's an entirely different story if you had a bunch of demolition charges in the building in contradistinction to an ammonia nitrate truckload out in front of the building. General, could a truckload of ammonium nitrate in the configuration that the government says it was have done the damage to the building? Absolutely not. Now, General, pardon. Let's say that uh, for argument, that bomb was professionally made, uh, it was fused right, timed right, everything was done as an expert's mission expert would have done it, just what would have been the damage to the building and would that have been possible if it was all correctly done with that truck bomb? Very light damage. General, with your background in explosives and munitions, uh, what's your speculation of what actually happened in Oklahoma City? I, I don't want to speculate. I want to tell you what happened. And as I said, I, I went through literally hundreds and hundreds of pictures that were covering uh, the removal of the debris uh, from the building site. And I was looking for those specific locations and the, and the columns at those specific locations where my analysis said you would have had to have had a demolition charge at. And uh, going through those, as they were clearing the site, all those uh, demolition uh, charge positions were clearly revealed, clearly revealed. Now, for the television audience, I have a number of charts here, but I will talk through them and sure. people can understand what is being said. Sure. Uh, the, first, the first picture shows the, real, the building down there just a few seconds before the blast. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see the cars, uh, the light poles, with some aluminum, there's an aluminum light pole fairly close to it. And the next picture shows uh, it's taken about 35, 33 minutes after the uh, demolition, mm -hmm. and there's a little aluminum light pole that's over there very close to the building. It's still standing. The sign that was over here, the signs are gone, but the frame is still across the street. Uh, the frame, the pole that was on is gone, and you have this monstrous gapping side of the building removed. I don't care what was in the truck. It wasn't whether it was a high-energy uh, military explosive or whether it was ammonia nitrate. Either case, you would not have had the energy to do to the building what was done, both from an order of magnitude as well as the pattern of destruction. <clears throat> okay. Now, for the benefit of the TV viewers, let me show a chart of the vertical profile of the building. This chart shows across the A row, A uh, the columns in red are not down. That was A2 through A8 are all down. Mm -hmm. And in the second row, column B3 is down. Mm -hmm. Before I knew precisely the location, and when I sent the letters to the Senate and the House, I put the truck bomb out where it was supposed to be, and I showed a sphere of ammonium nitrate about four feet in di four and a half feet in diameter, mm -hmm. with a pressure of a half a million pounds. By the time it reaches the first column, 
you're down below, uh, you're down around 2,000 pounds per square inch. By the time it reaches the second row of columns, you're, you're down around uh, somewhere between uh, 285 and 40. Well, just beyond the B column, you're, you're in the 40 pound region. <clears throat> and from there, if you reach out to, out to A7 from that location, you're down around 11 pounds per square inch, and the A7 was a very, very massive and heavy column. There's absolutely no way. Now, what a, the heck you could have brought it down from there. But I say this. The maximum reach of the, of the bomb would have been into B3 because that's where the column came down. Mm -hmm. But the, col the bomb, truck bomb, was not in front of column A3. It was over beyond column A4. And column B4 and B5 in the, in the middle row would have seen a lot more impulse than the column D3, which came down. In fact, it would be about twice as much impulse as column B3. And uh, so if you were going to bring down a column, it would have been B3 or B4 or B5, and certainly not B3. You don't have to go any further than that to know that you have a demolition charge on column B3. Now, if you look at those columns, uh, they have furring strip on them, and they have uh, sheet rock on them. Mm -hmm. And the sheetrock and, and furring strips are still on them. Uh, down at the, but at the first and second floor, some of the sheetrock and furring strips have been knocked off, but you see absolutely no spalling damage to those columns. So uh, columns a lot closer than B3 to the bomb, truck bomb, mm -hmm. still have uh, sheetrock and furring strips around them that weren't even knocked off. Now, you can't think about bringing down a, a, a column by blast uh, without cleaning that sort of stuff off if you had the power to, to collapse that kind of size of a column. So it you has don't need to go any further than that to know that B3 had a demolition charge. There's no other explanation. It's a closed set. General, you're telling me that somebody drilled those columns and then placed explosives on the columns? Well, they don't need to have drilled it. They could just have taped the satchel charge up against that column and, 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 would have, and have brought it down. But, General, we had a bomb outside, we had a demolition crew inside. How many personnel do you think were involved in this operation? Well, it would have taken several, and it would have taken people with access. You, know, you gotta remember that those federal buildings have uh, guards on the gate, and they have magnetometers and everything else. So it's not only a matter of how many people, but who had access. That's the problem. General, is there anything we haven't discussed or have overlooked here? I wanted to point out, I say there were four demolition charges inside the building. Okay. And I pointed out that there was one at the junction of the header uh, with the column uh, A7. There was also one at the junction of column A3 and A5 and at B3. Now, for the television audience, I have a chart that shows uncovered the evidence. Uh, right here, you can see the area has been cleaned out around column B3, and it was destroyed by demolition charge, appears to be a charge uh, destroyed by demolition charge, at the third floor level. You can see the rebar sticking up above uh, what remains of the concrete column. There's no <clears throat> other extensive damage around uh, on the column. It's just where the detonation wave uh, pressure ran out and the, uh, the granular de uh, destruction of that column petered out, but you still have the rebar still sticking up. Now, at the header, there's been uncovered. It went across. That's a, about a three foot by five foot, or a little less than that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can see column A3 standing up. There is no spoliation on it. You can see the rebar sticking out of the top. You can see the Art Deco rings around the column. And uh, that was the demolition charge at A3, peeled out the concrete from the rebar down just a little below, the, below that header. And you can see on the right side, the header to the right, you can see where the rebar is completely exposed and the, and the uh, concrete is outside of the uh, zone from in around that rebar. General Pardon, can you give us your conclusion to these matters? My conclusion is that there had to have been those three militia charges in the building at A3, A5, and A7, okay. and at column B3. 
Okay. Now, when I went to, when I wrote the letter to the House, I said it was perfectly possible for that to have been done because those columns were available for to people from the street. And I expected when I looked at it, if it had been some outside job, the demolition charges would have been at the base of B3, B5, and B7. But they weren't. They were up at the third floor level, which says those charges were on the third floor. And you look at the end of the column there, uh, it, look at the end of the beam over at column A7. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, you can see at the top of that column, you had more destruction than you did at the bottom. Mm -hmm. In other words, the, the uh, demolition charge was on top of the column at that juncture, inside of the building and not outside of the building. Why were they in such a hurry to bring the building down? Well, I can say that we don't know who, uh, who did the damage down there, but I know who's covering it up. They not only brought the building down, they cleared out the site, they covered the site with dirt, they carted the 200 tons of building over to a, a, a site, and I was under the impression it was a laid out for further possible inspection. But we went over to that site, and uh, there were guards at the gate. You were not permitted to enter, and we were told by the people at the site that all the material was buried. They dug holes and buried it. So the conclusions of your investigation is that there's another classic cover-up going on. Obviously. Obviously. It's a classic cover-up. A classic cover-up. So if you weren't under that desk, you wouldn't have uh, made it? Well, my floor was okay, and the ceiling had come down, but there was still concrete above, so it was just a corner of the office that was left that we were in. Everybody else that we worked with was gone. Are you okay? Just the corner of your office was okay? And the rest of the floor was completely uh, flattened? And we could go over the edge and look, and you could see the sky and as far down as you can look, and just a hole. And which floor were you on? Fifth. On fifth? Fifth floor. Please listen very closely to this momentous account given when events were still vivid in the mind of this survivor. Note that the building was already going down before any bomb outside had been detonated. Indeed, a street bomb would first blow in the Murrah building's window glass. This survivor's account has the building quaking several seconds before the glass was blown in. So just the one corner of the fifth floor wasn't completely flat? Well, higher, higher. What? From the east floor? I don't know what the west end of the building looks like. How did, how, did everybody just crawled out of the desk get back here? The ambulance? It, it was like slow motion. We crawled under before the glass started coming and everything. It just, it, it just seemed, to, seemed to roll in on us. I thought it was an earthquake when it started. It was just a, a kind of a shake and then it... Everything started going like this, and I, I dove under the desk, and then all the glass came in, and the ceilings came down, and I probably got cut worse if I hadn't been under the desk. I just got little scrapes and scratches. I was really lucky. Really lucky. Didn't we just hear this survivor indicate the building was quaking several seconds before the window glass blew in? Therefore, before any street bomb detonated, that part merits another look. It was like slow motion. We crawled under before the glass started coming and everything. It just, it, it just seemed, to, seemed to roll in on us. I thought it was an earthquake when it started. It was just a, a kind of a shake and then it, everything started going like this. And I, I dove under the desk and then all the glass came in. And the Let's put some of the pieces together. This survivor's account is in full accord with information on the news clips and General Parton's analysis. First... The bombs on the support columns at the building's lower levels were detonated, severing the columns and projecting debris across the street. Several seconds later, a street bomb detonated, blowing in the fifth floor's windows. The March 31, 1997 issue of the New American Magazine quotes other top technical experts, making statements similar to those of General Parton. While referencing the test demolition of an Eglin Air Base structure, which was similar to the Murrah building, Mike Smith, a civil engineer in Cartersville, Georgia, said, The results of the blast effect test one on the Eglin test structure present strong evidence that a single ammonium nitrate and fuel oil device of approximately 4,800 pounds placed inside a truck 
could not have caused the damage at the Murrah Federal Building, experienced on April 19, 1995. Even assuming that the building had structural deficiencies and that the ANFO device was constructed with racing fuel, the air-coupled blast produced in this 4,800-pound device could not have damaged the columns and beams of the Murrah Building enough to produce a catastrophic failure. Robert Frias, president of Frias Engineering of Arlington, Texas, after examining the test demolition, concluded the Murrah building would still be standing and the upper floors would be intact had the truck loaded with explosives been the only culprit. Moreover, Frias, a practicing engineer with over 40 years and a registered engineer in Texas, New Mexico, and Louisiana, stated explosives had to be placed near or on the structural columns inside the building to cause the collapse that occurred to the Murrah building. Likewise, Alvin Norberg, a licensed professional engineer in Auburn, California, with over 50 years of, in, in, of engineering experience on over 5,000 construction projects, writes that evidence from this data verifies that the severe structural damage to the Murrah building was not caused by a truck bomb outside the building and that the collapse of the Murrah Federal Building was a result of mechanically coupled devices, bombs, placed locally within the structure adjacent to the critical columns. Kenneth Gow of Whittier, California, with over a half century of engineering experience in the aerospace industry, writes in his evaluation, the Eglin Test Structure Report further reinforces the conclusion that a substantial portion of the Murrah building damage was by internal explosions. And indeed, if the omission of these authoritative accounts of General Parton and other technical experts cast doubt upon the credibility of our dominant media, how should we respond to an outright lie in that context? In the issues in May 1st, 1995 issues of both Time and Newsweek, these weekly news magazines showed artists' rendering of a huge crater in front of the Murrah building the crater produced by the alleged exploding rider truck. Both Time and Newsweek stated that the resulting crater was 30 feet wide and 8 feet deep. That's a crater big enough to swallow up a Winnebago or a medium-sized school bus. Now, why did Time and Newsweek just present the artist's rendering and not an actual photo of that huge crater? We know why. Because we have early video footage taken just after the bombing. Time and Newsweek did not present a photo of the huge crater because the huge crater is a lie, a hoax, an obstruction of justice, indeed, a crime against the American people. Where is that huge crater? Our raw footage clearly showed people walking here within the so-called huge crater area. Either those people are over 12 feet tall or that huge crater is a hoax. Wouldn't such a crater be very conspicuous? Well, where is it? We believe the huge crater hoax is just one glaring part of the bigger hoax created by our media and our government in order to cover up the truth that the Murrow building was blown up from within by people who had free access to federal buildings. Further confirmation of the government media fabrication of a vast crater may be found in Michelle Marie Moore's detailed account of the Murrah Building bombing titled Oklahoma City Day One. On page 61, Moore discloses that the plywood that workers placed in front of the building, supposedly to cover the huge crater, concealed instead merely some scattered debris. It appears that a tiny, suspiciously shaped crater, too small for detection by aerial video, might have existed. But this tiny crater was too small to plausibly suggest an explosion outside the Murrah building, large enough to have been the sole cause of such massive damage. Accordingly, the huge 30-foot wide by 8-foot deep hoax crater was invented to hide the fact 
that the critical bombs were strategically placed inside the building by people who were protected from above and who had free access inside the Murrah building. Eyewitness reports and expert testimony have firmly established that the multiple bombs that were placed inside the building contained explosive charges sufficiently to do all the devastation that we've seen. Therefore, it would appear that the purpose of placing a bomb in a vehicle outside the building was to divert attention from those who had access to those support columns inside. That this aspect of the cover-up has been successful may be seen in the focus of subsequent media coverage and government press releases, all of which wrongfully placed the blame for this tragedy on people who were in disfavor with the government. Prior to that awful day, so-called anti-terrorism legislation that severely curtails the ability of the people to defend themselves against government intrusions on their liberties had been stalled in Congress. After the Oklahoma City tragedies, Congress easily passed these bills, granting more power to the ATF, the FBI, and other government entities. It's more than curious that personnel from those agencies, said to be the target of the April 19th bombing were conveniently absent from their Murrah building offices that day. Could it be that the Murrah bombing atrocity was ordered by highly placed people in government in order to gain vast anti-terrorism powers? In such a case, the greater the atrocity, the greater the likelihood that they could achieve this increase in their power. Now, we're also hearing from some witnesses on the scene that they've overheard from firefighters that were first on the scene that there was a possibility that there was a secondary explosive device besides the car bomb device outside the building and that that device may have been placed near the nursery. Where has all this information gone? None of these reports of explosions and multiple bombs within the Murrah building was ever mentioned again by the dominant news media nor was any presented to the federal grand jury or at the bombing trial. Indeed, where has all this information gone? The next feature on this tape is a video affidavit made July the 20th, 1997 by Jane Graham, a HUD employee who was on the ninth floor of the Murrah building during the bombing. Most noteworthy, none of Jane Graham's startling information was ever carried in the dominant media, nor was any of it presented to the federal grand jury or to the jury in the McVeigh trial. July the 20th, 1997. And I am recording this in order to, um, to make an affidavit that what I say is, in fact, true and correct. Three weeks approximately ago, I was over to B.C. Lawton's house, who is a friend of mine. And when I was there, uh, Reed Walcott was also there, and they had a video that was playing in their uh, TV. And on it, there were appeared these two men. Let me, I, let me up close. I had a picture of, and I had this picture made off of the video. It is not very clear, but the video shows them perfectly. When I saw these two men, I asked them, to stop the video, that I recognized these two men, but that they were not dressed as they are here in this photograph. I have given considerable thought to when and where I saw these men. I first saw this taller gentleman here with the beard. I saw him on Tuesday afternoon. Uh, somewhere between the hours of 3.30 and 4.30. As I recall, it would have been that, that period of time. Day. And this was on the April the 17th, or 18th, I'm sorry, April the 18th. And that was on a Tuesday. And he was walking down the hall and um, coming from the west end on the first floor, going toward uh, passing the GSA offices. He was dressed in a blue shirt and pants, and I assumed he was there uh, replacing one of our regular men for, um, 
for the building temporarily. When I, uh, and, and I didn't think any more about it, except that he didn't look like a maintenance man. And um, I didn't, uh, I had just totally forgotten about it. And then the following morning, which would have been April the 19th, I saw both of these men as I came to work in um, uh, approximately 8 o'clock. These two men were coming out of the stairwell on the first floor uh, to the west of the elevator. Uh, they walked directly by me, probably within five feet. Uh, both of these men were dressed in blue pants and uh, shirts. And I thought at the time that they looked so different than our normal men and, and that GSA has in the building maintenance. And I thought perhaps that the other men either were on vacation and I thought it was odd that both would be gone at the same time. But um, I just felt they didn't look like uh, our normal GSA people that are employed in our building. I was asked by the FBI several times if I had seen anybody in the building, strangers, that were maintenance men, were dressed like maintenance people. And I had said no, because I had not thought, when they had talked to me about maintenance, I had thought about what I was thinking about was some repair person coming in uh, who was with the company. I had not even considered um, GSA people. And, uh, and they are, at, in fact, the building maintenance people. Uh, only when I saw these two men in this photograph did I realize that they were that these are maintenance people, and yes, they were different from the people, the men who are normally servicing in our office and in our building. This photograph came from a video called "Cover Up in Oklahoma" by Jerry Longspaw. I had not seen this video until, uh, as I say, three weeks ago had no idea until I saw these men did it register where and when I saw these people. Uh, I can only tell you that they were in that building on a Tuesday afternoon and a Wednesday morning. The, the taller gentleman, this man right here, was there Tuesday afternoon. He was also there on Wednesday morning. Both of these men were together on Wednesday morning. Um, I. I wish I could give you more information about them. I do not know them. I only know I was by them and that they were there and they were dressed like our GSA employees at the building to maintenance. Um, these are not the same three men that I saw in the garage who um, had what I thought was telephone wiring and a block um, it appeared like this, uh, probably two by three inches or three by four in that area of a small remote, but it was a, it was a putty color, um, a, block, a solid piece of block. I don't know what it was, but they had that and they had this wiring. When they saw me watching them, they were down there, they had plans at the building and they were discussing um, they were arguing, in fact, apparently there was a disagreement because one of the gentlemen was pointing to various areas in the garage. Um, they were talking about, um, uh, I assume, the plans of the building. I thought maybe they were telephone men at first. These three men were not the same as these two men on this picture. They, um, uh, when they saw me watching them, they took this wiring it, was tele it looked like cord, telephone cord, it was putty colored. They took that, they took whatever was else within their hand, I don't know what it was. They put all of that back into a paper sack. They put it in the driver's side, behind uh, the passenger's uh, seat, behind the driver's side. It was in a kind of, as I would call a pale green, a faded green um, station wagon. Uh, I did give that information to the FBI and to Stephen Jones. Uh, FBI did not uh, ask me to look at any picture. They only wanted to know if I could positively identify McVeigh or Nichols, and I said it was neither of those two gentlemen. Um, 
I gave them descriptions of the three men, but it was only when I saw this picture uh, of these two men three weeks ago did I realize that I had seen these men and that they were in fact in our building the morning of and the day before the bomb. And that is my testimony. My name is Jane C. Graham. I am an employee of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. I am a facilities management specialist. At the time of the bombing, I was a multifamily asset manager. My offices were on the seventh floor. I had occupied not only the seventh and the eighth floor, but I had just gone to the ninth floor when the bomb occurred. Um, in reflecting this, I, I want to specify that the first bomb, the first uh, impact was a waving effect that you got when the building was moving. Uh, you might have maybe felt a little waving, perhaps like earthquake movement, that, and it lasted for several seconds. About six or seven seconds later, a bomb exploded. There was an entirely different sound and thrust. It was like it came right from the center up. Uh, you could feel the concrete floor move a little. The last thing I remember was looking up and seeing the roof being blown off and uh, debris suspended in air. And I was thrown on my back and I became unconscious and debris came down on me and Sonia Key was on top of that. George Bird and both of those individuals took the debris off of me, helped me get up, helped me out of the building afterwards. But there were two distinct um, events that occurred. The second blast was not only very, very loud, it was also um, uh, very powerful. And as I said, it, it felt like it was just coming straight up from the center of the building, straight on up. And, now, and so that is my testimony, and uh, I will stand by this testimony. And uh, as I say, today is um, uh, July the 20th, and both of my grandsons are here uh, test, uh, as a uh, witness to what I have said. Thank you very much. Now confirmed uh, through federal authorities that a second bomb has been found inside that federal building in Oklahoma City. It was an explosion at 9 o'clock this morning that did that damage you're looking at right there. Well, I just took a look down the street uh, at the Morrow building again. I see another bomb truck going, so apparently they're going to try to get out that third bomb that's been talked about. At the present time, the medical teams downtown are unable to get into the wreckage to retrieve more of the injured because of the presence of other uh, bombs in the area. I've been told by the police department that just as soon as those bombs are defused, they will permit the medical teams to enter. First bomb that was in the federal building did go off. It did the damage that you see right there. The second explosive was found and defused. The third explosive that was found, and they are working on right now as we speak, I understand, both the second and third explosives, if you can imagine this, were larger than the first. Now, the Justice Department is reporting that a second explosive device has been found in the AP Murrah uh, building in downtown Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. The reports I have is that one device was, uh, was uh, deactivated. Apparently there's another device, and obviously whatever did the damage to the Murrah building was a tremendous, uh, very sophisticated explosive device. So Right now they are saying that this is the work of a sophisticated group. This is a very uh, sophisticated uh, device and um, it has to have been done by an explosives expert, um, obviously with this type of explosion. Two other explosive devices were found that were not detonated and they were larger than the first. But there were four bombs set to go off, according to ATF officials. Uh, that we have here, you can see the sheriff's uh, bomb squad. These people have been obviously very, very busy today. They've just pulled up. They're continuing to stay in the area. And uh, as we have more information, we'll bring it to you. Back to you guys. We should find out an awful lot uh, when the bombs are taken apart. I think it was a, a great stroke of luck. As you're mentioning, it's hard to talk about luck on a day like today in Oklahoma City, but it was a great stroke of luck 
that we actually have got diffused bombs. It's through the bomb material that we will be able to track down uh, who committed this atrocity. Where's all this information gone? It dug holes and buried it. It's a classic cover-up. A classic cover-up. Good morning. My name is Jane C. Graham. I am an employee of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. I went to work when we moved from Boston to Oklahoma City in 1985, and um, I am, or I was at the time of the bombing of the Murrow Building, I was a multifamily asset manager. I'm also president of the American Federation of Government Employees, Local 3138. I have been president for six years. I have been vice president prior to that for four years. And I have been um, employed by the department for 12 years as of October the 15th, or the 16th. And, um, that gives you a little background of, of my job. I am currently a facilities management specialist in the Office of Public Housing. Uh, about oh, between three and four months ago, I was at a friend's home, and at that time, uh, I happened to see they were showing a film. And on that film, I happened to see a picture of these two gentlemen. And I asked them to stop the video immediately. And I said, I recognize these two men, but they were not dressed like they are here in this video. They were dressed uh, in blue shirts and pants like our GSA uh, uh, maintenance people. And um, I would like to begin at the beginning uh, and bring you up to this point now in this story. And the reason I am doing this is as an affidavit to tell you that what I saw is the truth. There's no motive in it other than getting at the truth and what is important for the people that I represent and the union, as well as other members that, are, that we cover um, in, in the government as employees. Um, approximately two weeks prior to the bombing, I was in a snack bar at the Murrow Federal Building where our agency was located. We had the seventh and eighth floors of that building. Um, at that time, uh, it was in the morning and most of the people would go down, have coffee and visit and talk. Everybody was so friendly in that office building, in, in the government building. And one of the women who was there and um, had mentioned that she had been talking that morning to a a lady friend of hers who worked with the FBI and that they had been notified, she said, that, that there was going to be a bomb in the Oklahoma City on a federal building. And at that time I was very concerned and I came home and told my husband about it because um, the FBI was located at 50 Penn and they have a lot of um, stores and department stores and boutiques and it's a very tall building, all glass. And I was concerned because my granddaughter's mother worked in that building. And I said, surely they would not bomb uh, a building uh, where so many uh, citizens uh, and general public are. And, um, and I let it drop at that. And um, I'm sorry I didn't pay more attention now uh, at the time to who the lady was. Um, 
because I was just over listening to the conversation. Um, and then the Friday prior to the bombing, I drove to work and I parked on one level below the street level. I had a reserved parking space. And as I drove in that morning, I saw three men who were in the building, uh, in the garage area. They were standing with plans um, of the building, what appeared to be the plans of the building. They held them out. Uh, they were pointing to very various, various areas on the east side of the garage. Um, there was some discussion and a, obviously a little disagreement between the tallest of the, and the youngest of the three men. Um, I gave, <coughs> um, I watched them as they were um, having a discussion. The tallest young man went over to the north wall. He had a cigarette, came back, uh, didn't smoke it very long, uh, and then they took up again with their conversation. Uh, the one, the tallest younger man was uh, very dark, uh, had very dark hair. Uh, it appeared almost black. Uh, it was to a collar, uh, flipped up in the back. He had a, um, he had a black shirt on, western shirt, hat, a western hat, um, had a thick black mustache, very, very dark eyes. Um, what I call almost black, they were so dark. Um, the other two gentlemen, uh, he was maybe, I would say, 6'2", uh, had cowboy boots on, black cowboy boots on. Uh, the other two gentlemen were about 5'8", um, uh, light brown hair. Uh, the, the, one, uh, the one I did not get a good look at, but the, the, the gentleman who appeared to be in charge, that man had light brown hair, light eyes, was obviously had done quite a bit of um, either bodybuilding or, or weightlifting. His arms were very, very muscular. Um, uh, he appeared, if you were looking at him, I was asked by the FBI, what occupation would I have said just looking at him? And I said an engineer was the first thing that would come to my mind. Um, the second gentleman had a paper sack. When I first saw them, what, what caused my attention to uh, called my attention to him and these men were the fact that they were standing in the middle of the, the garage area. They were standing behind a light green faded station wagon. They had um, uh, <clears throat> they had the plans which were extended and I could see that. Um, the one man in the middle had what appeared to be what I thought was telephone wire. Um, he had um, uh, it was it was a putty color, and at first I thought, well, maybe they are telephone repairmen because we've been having problems periodically with the telephone company. And then I reasoned to myself that they couldn't be telephone men because normally they're out in the hallways and that we have uh, we have closets where all that is equipment is and so forth. So I dismissed that, and then I thought, well, since they had plans, I thought, well, maybe they were the gas company because we had had problems periodically with gas in that garage area. And uh, I was just curious more than anything. And, uh, uh, but when I saw this, this middle gentleman who had a, uh, as I said, he had this what appeared to be, looked like telephone, putty colored telephone wire. And, um, and it was on a, a small spool. And he had a piece in his hand. And I would have said it might have been oh, six inches long. Um, in that neighborhood, uh, there he also had something that was a, a block, a, a putty-colored solid substance, which was a block shape, um, and it might have been, um, I would say, maybe two and a half inches long, about like this, and and I don't know what it was, but as they saw me watching them, specifically the man who appeared to be in charge, uh, he said something to the other gentleman. They took that, what they had, put it back in the paper sack. He went to the car, went to the station wagon, behind the driver's seat, uh, the, the passenger's side. He opened the door and he put that in there. He put that sack in there and then came back. He turned himself away from me so I couldn't see his face. 
uh, that did make me suspicious because I thought, well, at that point they started watching me. And um, I had intended to go to GSA about it. And uh, this was approximately 8 o'clock in the morning. And I thought, well, no, I'll, I'll stop at some point during the day and, and uh, ask them who the men were in the building. I didn't do that because I, I just got busy and, and, and I, I let it go. But there were other people, uh, one lady in my agency, who also saw these same gentlemen, as well as another person who does not work uh, for the government, who had dropped off her children at the daycare. Uh, so that can be, uh, that can be verified. Uh, I did proceed to call the FBI and give them this information. Uh, initially, when I called um, after the bombing, I, I was thinking in my mind it was a Wednesday, and then I said, no, I went home and I asked my husband, I said, would you please look at, the, um, at our records? Did I have the car Wednesday or was it Friday morning? And um, he had looked because he had some appointments and it actually was Friday that I had the car. So I wanted to be very specific and make it very accurate. At that point, I, 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 wrote, um, I wrote the FBI, told them this. I also sent a copy of this same letter to Stephen Jones because I felt both sides should have the same information. Uh, I had made an, I had called, when I initially had called the FBI on this, and I spoke to an agent, Swecky was his name. Um, I, um, I told him what I had seen, and he asked me if I could identify McVeigh or uh, Nichols. And I said it was neither of those parties. Um, and um, he said, well, could you positively identify them? And I said, well, I haven't seen any pictures, you know, and I'm not sure until I actually would look, you know. I gave the description of what they had on, their clothing, how they were dressed, um, and uh, approximate ages. Uh, in the neighborhood, um, we made an appointment to, to meet. Um, he didn't keep his appointment. Um, I called back again. I asked him if there was some error uh, that um, I had an appointment with him at my union office, and he didn't arrive, and he said he was busy with something else. And um, so we made a second appointment. And again, um, that appointment wasn't kept. Um, when the FBI, he did ask me if I saw any um, unusual maintenance people that didn't belong in the building. And I told him no, because to me, when somebody is talking about maintenance people, I'm ta thinking our air conditioning, our, our um, uh, we have a um, elevator people someone who doesn't belong in the building. And um, so I, I talked about that, and I said no. <clears throat> then the, uh, they had several agents who came to our office, uh, and I was interviewed by a woman agent, and um, I'm sorry at this time, I can't remember her name. But um, she asked, she said they were interviewing within a 10 block radius, all the people uh, to get in, gather information. And she asked me questions, again, basically about McVeigh and Nichols and had I seen them in the morning of or the day before, um, had I seen the truck, anything unusual and so forth, and I said no. And she said, well, that's all the questions that she had. And I said, no, it isn't all the questions I had. And I said, what you're telling me then is, and then I went into the story about my having written them and the FBI and, and the information that I had given them, and she knew nothing about that. And um, I said, what you're telling me then is that you have not asked one person in all of this time if anybody else saw the same men that I saw. And she said, well, this is, they all have just a set of questions, and that was it. So I, I really, I let it go after the bombing. Um, uh, I, I worked, as I said, I worked on the seventh floor. Um, I had a, uh, my union office was on the seventh floor as well as my own workspace. Uh, my work area was on the east side, which is the area where you saw the big indentation. That was my area there that I worked in. 
um, that morning I happened to be in um, I happened to be in my union office, which was just west of the center of the building, and um, we were doing a report that we had to do on finances with the secretary and the treasurer. And uh, my husband happened to call, and in that conversation, I remembered I had to go upstairs to uh, a training program on Windows. I wanted to preview that. So I took all of our reports and went over to valuation, which is uh, at the north side of the building center, and uh, was talking um, with several of the ladies there. And um, I looked at the clock at that time. It was just 9 o'clock. And I told them I had to run upstairs. I'd be back because I knew they started promptly at 9. I wasn't going to be there on time. And, um, and I left them. When the bomb exploded, every one of those people in that area were killed. Um, I went up to the second, I went up to the ninth floor. I got there just um, about a little at, almost 902, because I had just sat down at the computer uh, and turned it on when the first wave hit. I remember thinking I had done something when I turned the computer on. And uh, because you had this waving motion, which was going east to west, um, it was like a rippling effect and uh, the building's weighing, and, and the young lady who was giving the, um, the training had told everybody, it's an earthquake, get down, get underneath your desks, and so forth. And of course, I was literally just stunned and just sat there at that moment. And then, a few seconds later, maybe eight seconds, seven, eight, nine seconds, somewhere in there, um, there was an explosion. And that was an entirely different feeling because in the explosion, you ha it felt like the thrust of it came from the center of the building up. And you could actually, you could feel like the, the concrete floor just uh, raising some, even on the ninth floor. And, and the last thing I remember was looking up at the uh, sky and the roof suspended in air and, and just all kinds of things just hanging there for a second. And I don't remember, any, remember anything after that. Apparently, I was thrown on my back and I was unconscious because two of my coworkers, um, uh, Droy McGirt and Sonia Key, um, they, Sonia was thrown on top of the debris, which was on top of me, which came down on top of me, and she was on top of that. And she removed all of that and she, um, then got joined she kept yelling to me was i okay could i hear her so forth finally when i came to i told her and i didn't remember till she told me afterwards that i had said i can't move and she said you've got to move we'll get your we're getting you up and out of here because it is it was a bomb and um she and Roy helped me get up and at that point there was so much black smoke you could hardly see anything in front of you and I had wanted to turn to the right which was north and she told me I couldn't go that way because there was nothing left there of the building and so then we did go out to the the west stairwell which is the southwest stairwell and we went down uh, we were able to get down uh, the stairs at that point and get out of the building uh, after that time I um, I have stayed away from, I have not read a newspaper since, nor have I watched a newscast since this time, uh, because I just didn't want to deal with it. And um, uh, I, um, I, and all this time has gone on, and I thought, well, and I just blocked what I could out of my mind and, and figured it would go, you know, eventually I, I could deal with it. And I went over to my friend's home to visit him, and we were discussing when they had a video on. And uh, in this video that he had in his, uh, in his TV, uh, it was about the bombing, and during that, I, that's when I saw these men. 
And I said, stop. I said, I recognize these men. Then, in the conversation, I said, these men were there. I said, the day before, the afternoon before, on Monday, I said, this, this, man, this man right here, he's, he, he's gray-haired, and he was uh, at least six foot two. Um, uh, this gentleman was um, uh, coming down the hall uh, in front of GSA when I saw him. Um, and, and you have to understand, the hallway leads uh, to the center of, of the first floor level. Uh, and it also has a door which goes to the outside on the west end, which goes where the trash pickup is and out to the outside. So I had I had seen him and I thought it was unusual because of his age and, and his appearance. He did not look like he was a maintenance man. He was dressed in, in clothes like GSA would wear. And I thought it was unusual. And I thought, well, if he was going to be having a second, if he has a second job, if this is, if this is, going to be his next occupation he really did not fit in it didn't look like he belonged and um, um, so I saw him as he was walking and going through the building um, the follow and I thought well it was odd that we had uh, that I wondered where our maintenance man was we had two that are, were normally always there together and uh, he was so different from the men that were normally in our building and appearance and so forth and so uh, I just thought well maybe one of them is on training or, or you know something is sick or something and we had someone else substituting the next morning I my husband dropped me off to work and that was between 8 8 15 that morning Tuesday morning uh, I wasn't paying any particular attention to the outside or anything but as I came in uh, both of these gentlemen, this one in particular, um, both of these men were coming out of the stairwell, and that is directly behind the elevators, and you can only come from the upper floors down. Uh, and and they, they came out the door. They were both dressed in GSA blue shirts and pants like they would wear, uh, walked directly by me, uh, past me. They were very intent on moving and moving quickly. Um, uh, and I really looked at, at them very hard because they neither one appeared like they belonged there. And I thought it was very unusual that I would have two, that there would be two men in the building who uh, would be taking the place of our normal GSA men. And um, I was surprised, and I thought, well, I can't imagine them being so different than the, than the, the regular men that were normally there, that we would have two at the same time out, and we would have two replacements. And only at that point did I connect with the thought that these must be the maintenance people that the FBI were asking about that were different, uh, that, uh, that didn't belong. And of course, to me, I never put GSA employees in that category because they were government employees and I didn't think about them as being specifically maintenance people. They were just government employees that did various things around the building. Um, and, and I realized at that point that is exactly what they were talking about. Um, I looked. Um, I was very interested at this point with these men because I wanted to know more about them. Um, and I had called uh, several people and inquired about them. I was told, oh, these two men had been identified. They gave me their names, told me where they had worked. FBI had already identified them and so forth, and that was, you know, that I was wasting my time. And I wasn't satisfied with that specifically because although someone may tell you something, I wanted to know for a fact since I had identified these two men, I wanted to know for a fact that these men were who I had seen. And so I proceeded to try and run down the two men. Uh, it took me um, about a week to, uh, to locate where the men were, where they worked. Um, and all I will say at this time is that the FBI did, identif did identify two men who worked as maintenance men, 
for the journal record. They are not these two men. Um, they are not in any way connected with these two men. Uh, and so to date, I don't know who they are, except that I can tell you these men were in that building that morning, and they were definitely moving in a very fast fashion, determined it would be my word for it. Um, and um, uh, they turned to the west in the hall, which would meant they would have been going out that exit where the... Um, um, where, the, where the outside exit was in, in, in the trash area. And, and the interesting thing was that this was about, let's say, 8.15, and they were dressed in those clothes. I don't know how at 9.15 or 9.30, whenever the video was taken, these men were already in their other clothing. And, and, um, and the question was, where did they change to me, and what, what, what caused them to change? And I have no idea. Um, I, I, I can't make any guesses. I won't make any guesses except to tell you that I saw these two men. I could identify them if I saw them. Um, uh, and I don't have a problem with that. And, and I, I am hopeful that there are some other people in our office who have also seen these same men. And... Uh, or at least in our in that building will see these men and come forward as well um, at that time. So that's my testimony. Um, to the best of my knowledge, I have tried to be as accurate as possible, um, and I would hope that these men would be brought to justice. I would like to also mention the fact that although this picture is not very clear, uh, unfortunately from the video, on the video, if it were still, it would have a very good uh, likeness of the two men. This taller gentleman here with the gray beard was balding, uh, wore glasses, maybe 6'3", um, um, maybe 225 pounds. Uh, in that neighborhood, 220. Um, he, the day before on Monday when I saw him walking in uh, down the, and, and there must have been something, he must have been, and I'm sorry to say I cannot remember who he might have been with, but he, there was a comment made or something, but I thought to myself as I was watching him come down the hall, um, he, he didn't really know what he was doing, and I, that gave me the impression that he, that he was new, and I was thinking if he has a new career, that this man, that, you know, it's a little late in life to start another career. And, and that was the impression I got. So he must have asked a question, how does something operate or whatever, because that, that led me to that, that assumption that this man is brand new at whatever he's doing. Um, the morning of the bombing, when I saw these two men, this gentleman here, the youngest man, uh, he has, you can't see very well, he has very, he had light brown hair. It was curly, kind of curly, down shoulder length. Um, rather, very, very hard looking young man. Uh, extremely hard looking, very determined. Would not be the kind of man that you would want um, uh, to be around, I'm afraid. He, he was very tough looking. His skin uh, was very, very bad was scarred. Um, obviously, it had a very bad complexion, but it also was scarred. And so um, I had noticed that immediately about him. Uh, he just looked mean. And um, uh, the two of them, as they were walking out that door, they, they looked like they had a purpose, a place to go, and, and, and they were moving. They, you know, when they walked right by me, I mean, they were in a hurry. I would also like to address just a little bit further the, um, the bomb, which I talked about. Um, I know they keep saying there was one bomb, but I can assure you being in that building, as well as other people in that building, uh, will tell you that there was more than one bomb because the first impact that you felt, as again I said, was this waving motion. And, <clears throat> and I was trying to think to myself, if. It, if it was an earthquake when that lady 
But when Sheila had said there was an earth, it was an earthquake, everybody get under their seats, take cover, protect your head, so forth. Uh, that took her a few seconds, and of course people were just startled and sitting there. They, they you know, I mean, it's not something you, you, of course you're concerned because you feel this rocking motion, this waving motion. But when the second, expo the second bomb went off, the explosion, there was an entirely different feeling. It was an explosion. It was from within. What I'm telling you is the explosion felt it came up. It came up from the lower floors up. It, it was not something that came in to the building, but it came up through the building. And there is a difference in that feeling, and I know others felt the same thing. Um, my husband, when he got downtown, he was um, out trying to locate me and talking to, you know, trying to get around. At that particular time, they were told there was another bomb. There were other bombs in the building. They they needed everybody to move back. They had found additional uh, uh, bombs in the building. Two other additional bombs in the building. Uh, they moved everybody back. Um, there was um, there was a point where. Um, Everybody was was across the street, and then they moved them a block farther. People started running, my husband said, and um, there were there were ATF men who were coming out of the garage area on the east end, and they were in fact carrying. They were marked ATF, and they were carrying boxes marked C4 uh, from the building. So. There are pictures to that effect that will be presented to the grand jury. Um, I am going to be testifying at the grand jury. I have gone to Washington. Um, there are, I have seen pictures. Um, I have seen pictures where the actual, um, the um, charges were placed in the building. Um, um, that, that they were that you could see the burn marks on on the columns where that occurred where the rebar had just gone down and, and sprayed out also uh, I know they've talked about a rider truck or a car bomb and these types of things having been there I did not see any crater I can tell you I saw pictures after the explosion, I have actually seen the photographs, which showed in front of our building in the circular area, we had a planter, which people use, concrete planter, which was maybe three feet tall, which people used to sit on and, and wait in the afternoons either for the bus or, or rides and so forth. Um, that planter was still there. Um, I saw a picture of it. And that con that concrete was still there, just exactly like it was before. And um, and if that truck was parked directly in front of that building, um, I I can't imagine you could do any kind of damage without affecting that. Um, if there was uh, any kind of a small hole um, that was uh, uh, in the ground, um, it certainly wasn't an enormous. Uh, depth. In fact, one of the pictures shows a file cabinet laying there, and the drawers are up, so it certainly couldn't have been more than maybe eight inches, uh, um, because the file cabinet was just laying right there on top of the ground. So, I mean, I saw that, and I know that. Um, they had, um, uh, there was also, uh, I know that uh, FEMA did a report, and they, they talked about the fact that um, one of the columns was totally destroyed and so forth. And in a picture I saw, it is right there, and it is marked. That column is right there and is marked. So I know it existed right after the bombing. Uh, I've seen the pictures of it, and, and those have been turned, as I said, those pictures and so forth have been given to... Um, Representative Traffic Hans Office and some other subcommittees in Washington, which hopefully will be getting to the bottom of all of this. Um, and um, they have, um, uh, and, and I'm not saying that there may not have been a car bomb, there may not have been something, 
but if it was, it was in addition to, uh, it was something uh, that was in addition to what was inside that building because the, what was inside that building is what caused the damage and the problem. And had, had the other explosives gone off, there would have been nothing left of that building or anyone in it for that matter nice to close the book. It was an easy way to close the book and chapter and say uh, it's over and it's done with. Um, uh, we have our, our man, our two men um, uh, who did the bombing and um, uh, I, I cannot believe that one man or two men did this bombing. Let me tell you I know this. Timothy McVeigh was in our building several times weeks before I have, I have co-workers who saw him in the building, who rode the elevators with him from the ninth floor down. Um, and the ninth floor, again, houses ATF. Why was he on the ninth floor? Those are questions that need to be asked. Uh, he certainly was, he was there to see somebody um, on the ninth floor. You just don't normally go up to the ninth floor unless there's a purpose or reason you're going to see someone, ATF or someone up there. I was in Washington with a young lady from the Postal uh, Service who, who talked to uh, John Doe, too. Uh, you know, he was the one who was in charge, Stephen McVeigh. Uh, Tim McVeigh held the door for this man, John Doe, too. Uh, John Doe, too, is the one who did the talking. Um, he is the one who was in charge, as, my, as, as, as Debbie said. He was the man who was in charge. And um, the other, uh, McVeigh was just following him along. So it was, she said, as again, she said, um, military came to mind. And um, so we need a lot of these questions answered. There is no question in my mind that the FBI knew about this. They were told about this. Um, my understanding was when Carol Howe had um, her, um, when Carol Howe had her court hearing, uh, her supervisor uh, admitted in court that Carol Howe did in fact notify them that the Murrow building was going to be bombed. Um, um, so again, it comes out that they were aware of this. They had prior knowledge of this. Um, that isn't to say that they actually took part in it, but they did have prior knowledge of it and did nothing about it. So omission is just as great as, as commission uh, in an act. Um, and, and, and it's certainly um, disheartening to see what they tried to do to her and her reputation and her life because they didn't want to admit that she was an agent, that she had credibility, she was found innocent of all of the charges, um, and they had to admit the truth that she had in fact told them of this. Again, I would like to, in wrapping up, uh, go over as my thoughts um, come to me uh, about the men that were in the garage the Friday before. Um, it was an impression that I had, but if, as a first impression, not only would I have said they were, the two men were engineers, but um, certainly they appeared to be what I would call a military cut. Uh, if you were looking at them and, and trying to guess what their occupation would have been, I would have said military. The tall young man would not have been. He did not look like a military man. Um, nationality, I, I cannot... Um, the, um, the tallest young man was having words, as I said again, with the man who appeared to be in charge. Um, uh, he appeared to have the authority. He was the man with the plans and directing the other two, definitely directing the other two in what he wanted done. And pointing to the areas on the east side of the building, I don't know what they were doing or what they were looking at, but they were definitely pointing to various areas on the south and the north sides of that building uh, in the center. Um, and um, the, the tallest young man 
obviously disagreed with one thing that the man that the man in charge said because that's when he walked away. Um, I guess to let his temper cool down, and afterwards came back. Um, it struck me as odd that the uh, when they were parked, they were parked in a reserved spot, which um, uh, they they weren't at the least bit concerned about being seen. They weren't. Uh, uh, they didn't appear afraid. Um, the tall young man just gave me a dirty look. Uh, the other man who appeared in charge, once he saw me really watching him and the rest, the other two, uh, that's when he told the second gentleman to put um, the package they had back into the car. To uh, and he watched me as I all the way till I entered into the building to go upstairs. Um, so at that point, I had attracted their attention as well. Um, I do remember. That, that morning as I came in, the morning of the bombing, as I said, I saw these two men coming out. These men, as I say, were dressed in blue shirts and pants like GSA employees would have been dressed. Um, when I got to the seventh floor, and I am sorry, um, I, I do not remember who it was, but someone did tell me that the... Um, uh, that the uh, bomb squad had been in the building. Um, in fact, they were saying that uh, someone that they had spoken with had made a comment about the fact that uh, they were they were in the federal building behind us on Fourth Street, and they were surprised that they parked in our building, and they were surprised that the bomb squad was in the church parking lot and had made the comment about, well, they guess some, they had another bomb threat. And, and more concerned with the building behind us than, than the Merle Federal Building. And, um, but that they, uh, that they had seen them and that they were in fact out there. And um, so, I, although I hadn't seen them, they obviously had been through our building because, because whoever told me it said they'd been in our building, so they must have seen them. And, and I'm sure that given uh, if, if they wanted, if the government wanted to find out uh, and actually talk to people that were in that building at that time, I am sure they would find some of the people that were there. Usually those were the people who were, came in at 7 o'clock in the morning from 7 to 8. Uh, they had already been through our building. I know when I got upstairs, and that had to be at least 8.15, uh, 8.20 when I got up. So they had already been through that building at that point, our building. Um, uh, but these men coming down had been in after the bomb squad had been there because that would have put them in after that time uh, when I saw them coming out of the stairwell. And, and the question becomes again, who were these people? Um, the, the men in the garage, um, no one ever asked me to look at any pictures uh, to try and identify any of these men. Uh, these two men still remain um, unknown. We need to know who they were and why they were there. We need to know about the men in the basement, uh, in the garage area. Why were they there? Who were they? Uh, why were they in a reserved parking area, totally at ease, um, uh, not the least bit concerned, only in the respect that they were concerned that I was watching them, and, and, and then they were watching me. Um, uh, I would, um, I think there are a lot of questions that still need to be answered. Um, just trying to remember little things that I might think of. Um, there are others, as I say, in our building who saw these same men that I saw, and um, who will testify if called by the grand jury. And so I think we need to get a lot of this out and uh, to have any information. Um, uh, as, again, as I say, I know that, that the FBI was notified of, of a bomb because I came home and told my husband about it two weeks before. So I'm very sure that they were aware of it because I was concerned thinking it was the FBI building that was going to be bombed. And, uh, worrying about my granddaughter's mother who was in that building working and um, so 
they did as far as i'm concerned they did know and that's my that's just my feeling but if i was aware of it and there were others in that coffee shop that heard the same thing then there was there would be no reason for for me to lie about something like that or anyone else because this they had had on occasion bomb threat it wasn't something uncommon um, that I mean it would be like the first time and, and people I don't really think took it seriously because they just couldn't imagine that that could really happen and um, but I really believe and know that they were notified and uh, that lady would not have said that um, if um, uh, if she had not talked to her friend at that time um, there was no reason for her to even make that comment other than just conversation about what was going on over there. Um, <clears throat> I know that um, the ATF wasn't there at that time, and and we've not we've not been able to get any um, uh, comments. They they keep saying, well, some of the men were there, some people were there. Um, I have heard, and I think if some were subpoenaed, I have heard the comments that they were told not to come in that morning, that they were under orders of secrecy, that it was a matter of national security, they were not to discuss any of this issue, period. They were not to tell anything. And I would hope that someone who was in that agency would have the courage to come forward and tell the truth and admit it. There's nothing wrong to be afraid or have have um, followed your orders that, that you were told to do. But I think you need, and I think everyone needs to admit the truth. And, and once that's done, I think we can get on with our life and get on with our business. And um, uh, I think it is a um, grave injustice to the government employees that work in the building and all of our buildings across the country uh, to try and cover up, to try and have agencies cover up, whether it be because of liability or whatever reason, uh, whatever the mistakes were, it's far better to admit the truth. And so I would hope that um, we will have enough of these people who will actually come forward and testify who are not threatened by their own agencies and the people within their agencies so that they can talk because you have to live with yourself.